Dr. Smith, what is the significance of the FDA's recent approval of gel, gel mito for patients with low-grade upper tract urothelial cancer? Yeah, so uh, maybe I'll take like a very quick step back and just explain what gel mito is. Um, uh, it's, it's an interesting drug. It's basically a thermoreversible hydrogel that uh, has mitomycin within it. Um, we have traditionally used that for low-grade uh, bladder cancer perioperatively. Uh, we've tried to use it for the upper tract, uh, but I think the, the fact that this is combined with a hydrogel that allows it to stick and adhere to the upper tract is really the... Um, uh, the most important part of this uh, specific drug and its activity. And as you mentioned, the FDA just approved this uh, April 15th, so this is really hot off the press. Uh, what I think is significant about it is that this presents a renal sparing option for our patients with low-grade upper tract urothelial cancer. And previously, for these patients who had recurrent low-grade upper tract urothelial uh, we didn't have a lot of options. Uh, certainly we try to treat them endoscopically as best we can. Many of them would recur. Uh, trying to provide uh, medication, so to speak, for example, mitomycin was challenging because of, uh, of course, the nature of the urinary tract is to excrete. And, uh, and so it was hard to get that drug to, to really stay uh, in, in the renal collecting system. So this particular drug allows it to dwell, um, and specifically, it allows it to dwell in such a way that it can ablate the tumor. And so for patients, for example, with a solitary kidney who have not a lot of options other than having their kidney removed, this presents a, an, a very important uh, um, treatment option to help spare their renal function. Uh, what makes UTUC such a difficult cancer to treat? Right, so I touched upon that a little bit, but upper tract urothelial cancer involves the ureter, of course, and the kidney. And really, I think it's about the caliber of the ureter. Of course, that's small, and we have limited equipment to treat tumors endoscopically in that way, accommodating that small caliber of the ureter. So, for example, um, what we can do in terms of staging the tumor is challenging. Uh, a resection can be challenging. Uh, in the bladder, for example, we can get all of our layers uh, fairly easily, uh, whereas in the upper tract, it might be more challenging. We may only get the superficial layer. Um, furthermore, uh, you know, it's, it's difficult to resect these tumors fully. Um, Again, just having these small biopsy forceps, we may not get the entire tumor. Um, I also think there are challenges with uh, uh, you know, laser ablation of tumors that can create strictures and other uh, side effects as well, and all in, in, um, in a way that still predisposes to recurrence. Uh, you know, I don't think that they uh, necessarily do a good job of reducing recurrence. And then the last thing is, is, again, something I already mentioned, is that, of course, there's gravity. You know, the, the renal system is designed to excrete, as I mentioned. So if you pro provide treatments like mitomycin, which is usually in a liquid form, um, they're going to be excreted. They're not going to dwell. Um, for example, for perioperative use of mitomycin C, we leave it in for an hour, so it has effect. We can't really get that same effect in the in the um, in the upper tract, which is going to excrete the drug. So gel mito, on the other hand, because it's a thermoreversible hydrogel, it allows it to stick and adhere to the um, the lining of the upper tract, and um, they, it does it in a way that you know if you put that drug in a freezer, for example, it's going to turn into a liquid. Um, as soon as it hits uh, more room temperature or body temperature, it's going to create a gel. And then the urine essentially wipes away or excretes the, uh, the drug over time. So it allows it to have that, that dwell time. Uh, how will urologists be involved with using this treatment? Yeah, so I think they'll be quite involved. I think this this is really going to be a treatment primarily delivered by urologists. Uh, you know, the way that we delivered in the trial, and you know, my institution at UNC Chapel Hill, the Lineberger Comprehensive Cancer Center, we uh, we delivered it through a ureteral catheter, and that's 
really what most of the investigators did in the trial. The FDA mentions that it can be delivered by uh, a ureteral catheter or a nephrostomy tube. I don't have experience with the latter, but I can say uh, that it was actually quite uh, simple to, to administer. I, I wasn't really sure how it would go. We're, we typically put patients to sleep. We, you know, do other things uh, to access their upper tract. But uh, really what, what ends up happening is you bring the patient in, you get a sense of their capacity of their renal pelvis. And uh, once you do that, you deliver the drug once a week. So you bring them in. Um, I actually didn't put any of my patients to sleep. Uh, they were able to tolerate that under, um, uh, uh, without anesthesia and essentially use a flexible cystoscope, enter the bladder, identify the ureteral orifice, place the catheter up to the renal pelvis, um, deliver the drug, and that's it. Uh, we did that once a week for six weeks, very similar to what we do for bladder cancer uh, induction. Um, so uh, I think it's actually fairly straightforward. Of course, you have to think about some of the uh, other needs, for example, fluoroscopic imaging to make sure your catheter is in the appropriate spot. Um, the way that the medication is dosed, as I mentioned, it, it needs to be frozen to be liquid and you need it to be liquid to deliver the drug initially. So it's sort of one of those aspects of uh, keeping the drug in a, a, a freezer and then getting that delivered right at the time you're planning to inject. But I think all those things can be easily worked out and um, certainly we became much more efficient over time delivering it in our urology office. Is there anything else that you think urologists should know about the approval uh, and the treatment itself? Well, I think it's important to understand what the indications are currently. Uh, the trial, the Olympus trial, which actually was just published in Lancet Oncology uh, a couple days ago. So, uh, you know, I would encourage any urologist interested in delivering this medication to read that trial. Uh, but, you know, it's important to understand the indications. So these were for patients with low-grade upper tract urothelial, either de novo, so their first, uh, first diagnosis, or recurrence. Um, and importantly, they, these patients had tumor left over. So again, this is ablative therapy. If they had a large burden of tumor, then the urologist would ablate it to be a more manageable uh, number. And uh, importantly, also, these tumors were located in the renal pelvis uh, above the UPJ. So keeping those types of things in mind. I think the other thing to keep in mind are always side effects. You know, you're going to be talking to your patient about the benefits and risks, and certainly the risks are something that uh, need to be mentioned. You know, in this particular uh, trial, and this with this drug, I think one of the, um, the highlights in terms of adverse events, something that I certainly will be discussing with my patients, is the uh, risk of stricture. And so ure ureteric stenosis was noted in about 43% of patients. Now, the majority of these were grade one and grade two. And, um, and of those who had some kind of urologic side effect, about 50% required a temporary stent um, to be placed. But, uh, but only 4% actually developed a stenosis that would have mandated something like a a permanent stent, uh, and both of those uh, patients actually ended up electing to undergo nephro-ureterectomy. And one could argue, I mean, this is, would have been their treatment. So, um, so I think that, you know, it is a side effect that is, is warranted for mentioning, um, but uh, I think it, it appears to be transient. So it's something we're aware of, but, and the patient needs to be aware of, they may require a stent. Um, but in the end, most of those adverse events resolved uh, on their own.